Excellent. All right, welcome everybody. Welcome, happy holidays to everybody. Here we are, I can't believe we are rounding the corner on 2020. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a 2020. Shall we just leave it at that? It has been a 2020 mm -hmm. and we are rounding the corner. Happy holidays. Hope you are doing well. You and your loved ones are safe and well. And we are thinking about you all. Sending prayers for a speedy recovery if anyone on this call is experiencing symptoms or knows anybody who is, we are praying for you. And um, if you have lost someone in your family or a friend, you are in our thoughts and our prayers. And may their blessing be for a memory. Uh, I'm Becky Berman. I am the moderator for this valued conversation that our esteemed host, Glenn Grossman, has been hosting for Oh my gosh, how many months, Glenn, has it been? I almost said years, but it has been many, many, many valuable months of conversation. As you been, know, what's that? So it's been nine months, but but we just hit. So last week we actually hit the 1,000 slide mark and forgot to mention 1,000 slides. Wow. So Glenn's spare time, of which he has very little, he has contributed over a thousand slides of conversation and answers to so many of our of our questions. And we are so grateful for all that you have done to take so many of our questions and, and really break it down into really, really val valuable nuggets that so many of us have applied into our everyday lives. And you've saved so many lives and we, we are eternally grateful for everything that you have done, Glenn, really, thank you. Uh, as so many of us know, Glenn Grossman is an epidemiologist with over 20 years of experience. While pursuing his doctorate in epidemiology at UNC Chapel Hill, Glenn served as an epidemiologist on staff at the UNC Infectious Disease Clinic for two years and taught epidemiology and advanced analytics at Duke Medical School and at UNC. He has been involved in epidemiology projects with Medicare, Medicaid. Let me turn your volume down. Whoops, hold on, let's pause for one moment and let's mute. There we go. Okay, he has been involved in epidemiology projects with Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Health Administration, Military Health Service, the CDC and other programs in the United States and outside of the United States. He is currently Senior Director of Outcomes Research and Epidemiology at Novartis, but all views expressed today are his own. So Glenn, as we normally do, you start off by taking us around the United States and then around the world and let us know, how are we doing? Thank you very much for the introduction, Rebecca. I appreciate it. And it's been a delight having you and everyone else uh, uh, in these discussions for the past nine months. It's been great. Um, I think it's definitely, I've gotten as much value as you have to see what the questions are and to really dig through the answers. It's been really uh, rewarding for me too. And I'm really glad that I can be there for people who have been infected, trying to track down where the, the um, monoclonal antibodies might be and keeping people up to date in terms of what, um, what is out there. So um, with that, let me share my screen. <clears throat> All right, so let me start here. So I have, so there's good news this week. Um, so it's mixed news, but, but, uh, but the, there is good news mixed in. So the first thing is um, cases have started to level off. Now we know that the United States is huge, but, um, but regionally there's still variation. So some regions are doing well and some regions are doing poorly. Um, but at a national average, you see that it's kind of leveling. So uh, what, let's dig into that a little bit more. Um, on the bad side, so hospitalizations at the national level are still rising and we are at approximately 112,000. So uh, that's still rising, which is, which is not good at all. The current uh, death rate, if you look at the average over the last seven days, um, daily, we're hitting around, uh, we're hitting over 2,500 deaths per day. 
on average uh, over the last seven days. And so, and it's increasing. So this is, this is bad. It's worse than the models we're predicting for, for where we'd be right now, um, but consistent with what we were looking at uh, last week and the, and the week before in terms of uh, consistent with those models at this point. Um, we're on the same trajectory that we were at last week is what I'm saying. When we look at the regional variation, so right now this is, um, uh, this is the to total United States. Uh, so the Midwest, which was doing really poorly, is still not doing great, but they're on a much better trajectory. So the number of cases are, are the daily cases are going down. So there's, they're still getting 40,000 new cases a day, which is terrible to have that many new cases a day, but it's better than they were doing where previously just a couple weeks before they were having over 65,000 cases a day. So they're going in the, in the good direction. The R is, is below one to generate caseloads like this. Um, the, it's reflected in the hospitalization data. So the number of people currently hospitalized has been going down slowly. <clears throat> and you can also see it in, among the deaths that the number of deaths is, is decreasing some. Um, and so, so this is good. When we do a comparison regionally, so it becomes clear, uh, you can see that the Northeast is sort of flattened out. So after Thanksgiving, we, di we didn't really see a major spike since then. Now we're approaching the Christmas holiday and the New Year's Eve holiday. And so a lot of us are expecting that we will see uh, sort of continued growth uh, within the 14 days uh, period following those two holidays. Um, but the Midwest, you can see, um, we really got its act together. Uh, it's, it's, it's not out of the woods yet but it's going in the right direction. The South uh, is, at a, is at the highest rate in the country and still increasing, and the West also increasing uh, dramatically. Um, so now if you look at, at uh, the cases are, are going all over the, the country right now, uh, but if you look at hospitalizations, whoops. So, um, so these are where, um, around the, the country where the hospitals, where most of these cases and, and hospitalizations are occurring. But I prefer to look at the cases per state and per capita rather, uh, because this shows sort of the burden on each of the states. So for instance, uh, California, which we saw over here, although it had the most hospitalizations, um, it has the most people and it has the most hospitals. So if you do it looking at a per, per capita basis, you see that um, it's not doing great in California. In fact, it's, it was enough that they're really putting restrictions on, on, on movement of people. Um, but you see that there's many, many other states doing far worse based on this per capita, looking at per capita. Um, and so again, the Midwest is still not anywhere out of the woods, but it's better than it had been in the previous week. So for instance, if you look at North Dakota, you can see that it's on a downward trajectory. You look at South Dakota, similarly downward. Um, so all of these, it's, it's Nebraska, they're, they're going in the right direction. Um, and so, so at least there's that. Um, my worry is that if in states, if they see themselves going in a good direction, um, then they might let their guard down for Christmas or New Year's, and then that won't be good, and then we'll start to see things rise again. So we have to really keep our, our guards up and, and keep an eye on this stuff. But, um, but yeah, this is, this is uh, still having a uh, two two more months of winter, three more months of winter, um, and so we need to keep our guard, guards up here. Um, in terms of, let's see, anything else to look at here? Um, no, I think that's enough for now. Let's look at the global. Let's look at global. So a few things that we'll be talking about today. So first, uh, I didn't really prepare anything for Sweden, but it's always good just to look at Sweden. So this is, um, so Sweden, if you recall, throughout much of the year, they didn't have the mask wearing uh, re requirements that we did. They didn't have the stay at home order uh, orders. And so a lot of us were, have been tracking Sweden because a lot of people who were against uh, common sense restrictions on, on movement during an epidemic uh, pointed to Sweden as a success story. And Sweden, although they claimed that they weren't going for sort of natural herd immunity at times, they said, oh, well, it's consistent with what they were looking for for natural herd immunity. So it's a reasonable question to see, well, did keeping their, their uh, country open earlier in the year help to prevent any cases or deaths now that we're later in the year? And you can see that uh, here's the European average 
Um, and you can see Sweden is far, far above the European average. So it did not help prevent cases in any way. Let's look to see if it prevented any deaths. So here, let me this let me go here from the beginning of the year. It'll make it a little easier to see. All right, so here is Sweden. Here is Europe. Uh, let's do a cumulative deaths because it's a little bit easier to interpret. So here's Europe. Here's Sweden. So Sweden's approach contributed to more deaths on average per population, uh, so per million, than than the European average did. So we can say at this point now that the vaccines are rolling out. Um, and, and so Sweden should be protected within the next few months. We can say at this point um, that Sweden's approach failed, um, that if they had done more that other countries in Europe had done with lockdowns and with, with more uh, careful um, requirements that they, and, and that were more in line with the Europeans, then if they had hit that average, then they would have saved quite a lot of lives. Um, and so, so we can say that now. Unfortunately, there's two other things here. So there's the United Kingdom, uh, which has a relationship with Europe. What, I don't know exactly what that relationship is as of today, but, uh, but they have a relationship with Europe, um, the European Union. They, um, their cumulative death has been high uh, because they were also somewhat reluctant to shut down early on, similar to the United States. And so they were uh, not doing very well. And then again, over the last um, uh, couple of months, they haven't been doing very well. Um, and, and they're doing comparable to the United States. In the United States, as we were just looking at, there's wide variation across states within the United States. So when you look at, at who's being hit hard, some states are being hit exceptionally hard. So for instance, North Dakota, if it was its own state, um, if we looked at deaths, so that's this, it's a little hard to look at. So I'm just gonna spend just a second on it. But um, if you look at deaths, so here's South Dakota, here's North Dakota here. Um, if, uh, if each of these states were their own country, they would be among the hardest hit countries in the world. So we know that there's variation within the United States to give us the, the national average. And it's the same thing within Europe. Some states are doing better, some worse, um, but United Kingdom is, is among those that are, that are doing among the worst. Um, one of the reasons we'll get into a little later that they have a new variant that's starting to spread um, we'll get into that. United States does not have that excuse. Uh, for us, it's simply been poor management. Um, there, I think there's been a lack of trust in the population. And so a really, really poor um, adherence to the recommendations and requirements of wearing masks and physical distancing and, and staying at home and uh, staying outdoors when possible. So, um, so that's what it's, is explaining the United States. Um, I will keep it at that for now. One, one other thing I can just mention, so here's the current uh, dashboard for um, mandates and requirements, restrictions and mandates. And so you can see that a bunch of states have um, mostly closed their businesses, but a lot are remaining open. Some, some are mixed, particularly in the Northeast uh, where we got hit er pretty hard uh, in the first wave back in March, April. Um, and so, but you see that some have uh, mostly closed. Mask requirements are still very common, except for, for uh, the central, uh, the swap in the middle and state home orders are not common um, although they should be based on some of the projections and the death rates but um, but they are in, in some of the states occurring. Um, all right so with that let me open it up to questions because there's a lot of really interesting questions to make. Rebecca back to you you're on mute. Okay thank you Glenn. Thank you. Thanks for taking us around the country and all the way around the world. That was, that was a very quick journey. I'm glad to see we're starting to see a touch of, a, of good news. That's, that's pretty exciting. I, I wasn't ex expecting to see that. So we'll yeah. take it. I like when we see the good news, particularly when the good news is in green. Maybe you'll show us some maps, some more maps in this conversation. In <laughs> <laughs> Not today, but another time for sure. All right, we'll be on the lookout. All the right. The closest so, I could get is blue. Here, here's a blue current hospitalization. It's not, it's not a good map though. Um, so again, the Midwest is doing for hospitalizations. Midwest is is on a downward curve, which is good, uh, but they still have a lot of people being ho newly hospitalized uh, every day. So that's so that's not good. But we'll you take, can we'll yeah. take it, even though it's blue. We'll take it. I wasn't expecting to see that. That's that's, <laughs> that's 
that is definitely a downward curve. So that's, that is nice to see. Okay, let's move on. We, there has been a lot in the news these past couple of weeks about the vaccines. And I asked you this week, so the vaccines, as you mentioned a couple of weeks ago, and you talked about, you showed us that great article from the New York Times about the line and where different folks would kind of fall out in line about uh, where, where we might fall. And, and you suggested perhaps you and I might fall out in um, April, May timeline, June, something like that. Okay. And then I asked you this week, with the double dose, does it have to match kind of like a pair of shoes? You got to get the same dose from the same manufacturer, yes? So you want to pay attention to, to the manufacturer of, the, of your vaccine. Um, can you give us a high level update on the vaccine and which is better? Does that, is one better than the other? Does, based on you as a candidate, can you tell us a little bit more? Absolutely. So um, before I say anything else, let me uh, just give you a high level overview as of this afternoon. So, so far, almost 3 million doses have been distributed around the country and almost 600,000 doses have been administered. So over 550,000 have been administered. That's a lot. That's, I think it's in the past week, I mean, maybe over a little over a week. I don't know, I don't remember exactly uh, when the Pfizer was approved, but, um, but this is a lot. This, this is very rapid. Hopefully it's gonna get even more rapid in terms of how much is distributed each week, but this is a lot, half a million in, in uh, a short period of time. And so all everything we're about to be talking about, like if we talk about um, side effects or anything else, remember that is that they're very rare. Anything you read about the news with 556,000 people being vaccinated, getting their first dose so far, if you hear about five cases of something or 10 cases of something, that means it's really, really, really rare. So it's almost an academic question. Um, rather than something you need to be more personally worried about. But we can go through the details in the, in the coming slides. All right, so first, which is better, the Moderna vaccine or the Pfizer vaccine? The simple answer is they're both essentially the same. Um, there's no difference. You get whatever you can. Um, it's very, very hard to get the doses right now. There's very short supply. So if you're in one of the groups that has been privileged to get the vaccine, vaccine because you're at higher risk and there's a bigger requirement for you to get it, definitely take whatever you can get. And so typically I think based there, I think the rollout is going to vary. Uh, so because Pfizer requires a more uh, challenging logistical distribution because of the, the um, temperature requirement, it has to be really, really, really cold. Um, it makes it easier to distribute the Pfizer vaccine if you can distribute it where there's a lot of people around. So where you can just store it somewhere and then have one person after the next, after the next come in to get injected one at a time. So if you have a high density of people, then that's a really suitable place to have a Pfizer vaccine distributed. Whereas the Moderna vaccine, because it only requires a regular freezer, it's a little bit easier to then send out and distribute to rural areas or suburban areas that have less population density, because then you won't, you won't necessarily have lots of people standing in a line. Instead, you can distribute it and give a dose and then wait a little while and give another dose when someone's available. So that's more that's uh, better for Moderna. And so therefore you might see some distributions just around the country based on the, the, um, the population density and, and other logistical things going on. Um, what I have here, I'm not gonna spend too much time in it, but so the, uh, I, what I wanna just emphasize is the Moderna. So, so um, the Moderna vaccine just got emergency use authorization this week. Um, they are, uh, it's the same, it's essentially the same as the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, the key takeaway here is that um, there were 30 cases of severe COVID-19 reported in the trial and every single one of them occurred in the placebo group. Not a single case of severe COVID-19 occurred in the uh, vaccinated group. So this is amazingly, uh, it's, it's doing amazingly well. We could, we, no one anticipated that it would be so effective. Uh, the effectiveness and the safety profile are amazing. Everyone in my family, every one of my friends, every one of my friends' families, if you hear this, please do not hesitate to get the vaccine as soon as you are able to. Um, all right, so let me go into some of these other things that people are wondering about. Okay, so the administration, 
there are some slight differences. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine is supposed to be administered three weeks apart. So there's the first dose and then sort of this booster dose uh, and it needs to occur at least three, three weeks apart. So at least 21 days apart. Whereas the Moderna is approximately one month. It has to be 28 day, at least 28 days of, of, apart. Now, the second dose that we're talking about, say for some reason, you know you're not gonna be available at exactly 21 days or exactly 28 days. They give you a grace period and say, well, you can come a few days earlier if you need to, up, up to four days earlier if needed, but it's better to, to extend it out. And if you pass the 21 day mark or 28 day mark, um, then that's okay. Uh, you just need to get the, the administration as close to the second uh, uh, time period as possible, but, um, but there's no maximum interval between the first and second dose for either of them. Um, interchangeability. So there is no interchangeability, as you said, it hasn't been studied in clinical trials. There was no crossover uh, evaluation of these two vaccine products. So we have no idea of the safety or efficacy. So what you get the first time is what you need to get the second time. Um, in terms of the authorized age groups, so the way that vaccinations like this typically work, you um, typically give them out on people who are lower risk. Uh, I mean, we did high risk people here in terms of people who are older, had comorbidities, because that was really the group we were looking at. But for kids, we didn't really focus on them for the first rollout of the vaccines. But now that as the vaccines roll out and the clinical trials continue, we'll be doing continuing studies to see how safe and effective it is for people under the age of 16 or under the age of 18. You can see that they incorporated some of these kids into the different trials. So for instance, Moderna only included people 18 years or older, whereas Pfizer included people 16 years or older. But because they're both relatively the same, uh, that cutoff is roughly the same. I mean, technically you should be uh, adherent to what the um, clinical trials were. All right, next couple other interesting things here. Um, we'll get into them in a bit. I think this is it for now. Were there any other questions you just asked or, or what well, are your next questions? One of the questions that came up and you kind of touched upon it were was about the severe allergic reactions. Mm. If, if you wanna just kind of speak to that a little bit more. Yeah. So that's a good point. So, all right, so here's the tricky thing. So itchy skin and that kind of stuff is a very common psychosomatic side effect. So if people read in the news that people get, that other people have gotten allergic reactions to the vaccines, it's not gonna surprise me at all if now people are gonna go and get the vaccine shot and they're gonna suddenly be itchy because that's just a very, a very common psychosomatic thing. However, in terms of true anaphylaxis, a true severe shock or, or tr a true severe uh, allergic reaction, um, that is, uh, happens typically within 10 to 15 minutes, most, most commonly within 10 minutes. And so people who get it typically have gotten them before. This is the kind of thing where you need an EpiPen for, so essentially a, pu a shot of pure epinephrine. Uh, and that, that's a, a British term in, in the United States, it's essentially, we call it adrenaline which is essentially the same thing. So it's a, a shot of pure adrenaline that just gets your heart pumping and, and just uh, it helps the body to process it. The symptoms of anaphylaxis are what you would imagine. So challenging breathing, that's the most important one and what makes it such an emergency. Um, if someone does not have an allergic reaction within 10 or 15 minutes, then there's no, there's no worry. So that anyone who goes home, who, get, who, who gets the vaccine and then might feel itchy afterwards, that is not a symptom of anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is an acute response to, to getting uh, exposed to something. So you don't have to worry if you feel a little itchy. If you do feel itchy um, and, and it's something that's persistent that bothers you, then feel free to report it to your, um, to your, uh, uh, to your doctor or wherever you received the, um, the, the vaccine, just so that they're aware of it. But most likely it's, it's not something to be worried about. Um, all right, other things about allergies. So there were a few specific examples. There were some in the, in the UK that were reported, some in the United States, not a lot. We're talking about a very small handful, two here, a few there. Um, one example here was a middle-aged woman with no history of allergies, had an anaphylactic reaction that began 10 minutes after receiving the vaccine uh, in Alaska. She experienced a rash over her face and torso, shortness of breath and elevated heart rate. Um, the hospital's emergency uh, department gave her a shot of epinephrine, so an EpiPen or, or something similar. Um, her symptoms subsided 
Then what's unusual is that they reemerged. And so she was treated with steroids, uh, which reduced the immune response and, and, and epinephrine drip, uh, so an IV. And, um, and then they tried to stop the drip and the symptoms reemerged again. So this is worrisome for her. If this does occur, it's the fact that it's persisting is a little bit worrisome. But then they kept her overnight. They weaned it off. She's doing much better. It's the same thing with the other cases that they've identified. Um, and so, so even among the ones who did experience this, it's not a long-term consequence that they need to be worried about. It's something that requires observation and management, but not something that's worse than COVID-19 for it's being hospitalized for COVID-19. Um, all right. Did I hear a question? Uh, Be Rebecca, can you mute everyone again, please? Yes. Okay. I will mute everybody and want, let's see here. We have a couple of questions, a couple follow-up questions about uh, the vaccine. What? One pertaining... One uh, more thing, uh, Rebecca, just for, to hold you for one second. Sorry about that. I just want to say two more things about the allergies and then I'll come right back. Sure. All right. The first is that, um, is that uh, Dr. Jay Butler from the CDC says that this actually means that the... Um, that our monitoring is working. The fact that we identified these people who had anaphylaxis, it was reported back to the CDC. Everyone's aware of it. It's totally transparent. This is a good thing. It means two things. One, it means that our system is working, that we're transparently tracking everything and are aware of it and are able to communicate it out to the entire uh, US. Two, it means that we can set things up. And, and the third thing that it means is that um, because we know up here that so many people have been vaccinated and that the numbers are so low that it means the risk is really, really rare. I mean, we're talking about something that's that is occurring one in every 50,000 or one in every 100,000 people. So it's really, really rare. Um, the one other thing to say here is not that, is this one. Um, so Dr. Paul Offit, a medical expert, a vaccine expert, um, and he, he supports uh, and gives advert, ad, uh, advisory support for the FDA. Um, he, he says he's not concerned about this at all. It doesn't mean we should pause any rollout. Um, this is something that you would expect with vaccines that there'd be uh, allergic reactions to a small number of people. So it's something to monitor. And in particular, he says, we need to look out to see what component of the vaccine is causing the reaction. And then maybe for those people that are at high risk for that component of the vaccine, we can adjust uh, and, and maybe going forward, there might be other vaccines that become available um, that lack that uh, thing that's triggering their allergy. So this is just for the first two, two vaccines. The other vaccines are gonna have different ingredients. And so perhaps they can, uh, people who might be at higher risk for some of these ingredients can just wait for some of the newer vaccines coming out. All right, Rebecca, back to you. Thanks, Glenn. Okay, so uh, just a couple follow-up questions. So Jane has asked a question about um, the, the different vaccines and how they pertain to the different strains of, of, of the virus. And then a second question that's come in is um, Pfizer and Moderna tracking for Bell's palsy. And can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, let me start with Bell's palsy because it's, it's interesting. Um, so first, to pe people who don't know, Bell's palsy, uh, but, uh, excuse me, Bell's palsy is sometimes caused, uh, called idiopathic facial paralysis. Uh, you know, the best definition of, idiopath of idiopathic, an epidemiologist uh, friend of mine in, um, in grad school said, idiopathic is when there's a pathology, so a disease, and the doctors feel like idiots because we have no idea what's causing it. And that's essentially the definition of idiopathic is when there's a disease process and we don't, it, we don't know what's causing it. And so, the, and so it's sometimes called idiopathic facial paralysis. It's frequently associated with viral infections and other things. It can occur for people, for all different kinds of people. Um, uh, it's essentially what it is in terms of the symptoms. It's a sudden weakness in the muscles on one half of the face. So one half of the face is just fine. And then suddenly the other half groups and people lose control of it. Um, and so it's, it's very frightening for people who experience this but it's also self-correcting in almost everyone. So it's not something that most people uh, need to worry about long-term. However, if there was an association between the vaccines and Bell's palsy, then this would be something worrisome that we would want to track. Um, epidemiologically, this occurs a, a, uh, approximately 23 out of 100,000 people per year. Now we know in each of the vaccine trials, there were approximately 40,000. I think there were like 40,000 in um, the Pfizer vaccine. So of those 20,000 were on the vaccine. Um, and then there were 
30,000 total in the Moderna trial. And so 15,000 of those were on um, the vaccine. And so you'd expect between the, the 20 and the 15, um, so that's 35,000 total, you'd expect, that's, that's, you'd expect around 10 cases or so uh, just between the two trials, regardless of whether they were in the back. Uh, so the total number of people, let's say this. So there were 40,000 in Pfizer, 30,000 in, um, in Moderna. So that's a total of 70,000. So you'd expect close to what, like 18, 19 cases uh, relative to the total number of people in the trial totally, regardless of whether they were in placebo or in the vaccine trial. And what they found were that there were five cases, I think roughly order of magnitude in, in, um, in the Pfizer trial and roughly five in the Moderna trial. And so order, order of magnitude, I forget the exact, the exact number, I should have put that here. And so, and so what this means is that, um, is that on average for the trial as, trial as a whole, uh, it was roughly the same as what you would expect in just the United States as a whole. And so just by randomness alone, you'd expect some people with, who ended up with Bell's palsy to end up in one arm of the trial and some in another. As it turns out, more people with Bell's palsy ended up in the vaccine arm than in the, in the control arm, in the placebo arm. So, be, but because of this, because we, there were some more cases of Bell's palsy in the vaccine arm, this is something that led the FDA and the CDC to say, well, this is something we should track in the vaccines going forward, just because it was slightly higher in the vaccinated group. However, like I said, it wasn't higher uh, in the total trial than you would expect in the population at large. And so a lot of us are just assuming this is just due to just randomness of random variation due to just being put in one arm versus the other. In fact, what you expect is when you do a trial like this uh, and you do randomization, you're always are gonna expect, they're, they're not just gonna look at a couple things. So they set up the trial to look for severe symptoms of COVID-19 and, and to look at the major outcomes they were looking at. But because the vaccine's so new, they were looking at every possible disease outcome that exists to see if there was any signal of any kind in any other disease area. And the problem when you do such vast number of investigations all at once, is simply by randomness alone, something that occurs one in a hundred um, is it, you're gonna see one in a hundred times on average. And so if you're looking at thousands of different possible diseases, then you're going to get variation in, in a lot that are just going to be just random. And so right now this Bell's palsy is not something that uh, people are concerned about. It's not, first of all, it's very rare. And the key thing, the key reason that people are particularly not so worried is like I said, that epidemiologically, the total numbers in the trials were roughly the same, what, what exactly what you would expect as the same as of the general population at large in terms of how common it is. But because it existed, it's being followed through. So that's good. It's just the CDC is doing exactly what it should be doing uh, and, they're, and they're tracking it in the population. So, so it's good. Um, so that's the Bell palsy question. What was the other question, Rebecca? Okay, great. Thank you, Glenn. So, so Jane in our audience, thank you for your wonderful question about asking about the the multiple strains of the virus and and how these different vaccines will impact and how effective they will be in impacting against the different strains. Yeah. Do you want me to jump into the UK or should I just proceed uh, with this? So essentially, as far as we know, there is no difference with any strain out there. So right as of now, to our best evidence, um, the that both vaccines, the both mRNA vaccines that have uh, uh, gotten approval, the emergency use authorization. So it's not tech, it's not full approval yet, just the emergency use authorization. Both of them were look were were vaccinating people in the general population. There are lots of strains currently going around, um, just because the virus is mutating, and so um, luckily the virus is not mutating a lot. And in particular, the surface protein that the that these uh, the, the S antigen that the um, uh, vaccines are focusing on are hardly mutating at all across all the different mutations. And so, because of that, there's not any expectation that the current uh, of current uh, strains that are going around they're not really strains because it's the the mutations aren't far enough away from each other to really be different strains like we talk about the flu. They're really what we're calling variants, uh, where there's some different mutations. It's essentially the same 
uh, the same virus strain, but there's some variations that we're seeing so far. And so right now, the vaccines are not expected to be um, ineffective on any of the, the, the um, variants that we're currently seeing. Well, that's good to know. So I guess let's let's then jump into what's going on in the UK. Is that considered a variation, that mutation, or is that considered a different strain? You're teaching us a whole new vernacular, or at least you're teaching me a whole new vernacular when it comes to all of this. In fact, I'm glad you brought that up. So let's talk about definitions for a second. So a mutation is used to describe a change of a single nucleotide in the virus RNA, RNA genome. So the RNA is a long strand of ribonucleic acids. A single one of those, a single nucleotide, um, is, uh, can, can, can uh, either be deleted or altered to be a different one or, um, or a new one can be added on. And so they're tracking these. And so anytime there's any change in those nucleotides, that's called a mutation. A viral variant, is if there are a bunch of different mutations that are traveling together, then it sort of might alter the behavior of the virus. So it's not just a single mutation, but a bunch of different vari uh, of, of different mutations together, then that's called a variant. It's what some people sometimes refer to as a strain, but I like to clarify that it's not really, they're, they're not enough mutations to really cause, cause uh, call it a different strain. It's really just a, a small number of mutations that are just called a variant because you can track it. Um, and then a lineage is uh, variations in the genome of the virus that come from a specific variant. So say you have a variant, that's gonna keep on evolving with additional mutations and we'll have lineages that come from that. And you can track that across time and across geography. So it's really interesting. So in UK, I'm, I'm gonna spend some time digging down into the UK because there's a lot of interesting things here and a lot of people have questions about it. All right, I, I can tell you that I think seven different people uh, over the last two days have asked me about the UK variant. Um, so this is something I will, I will spend a bunch of time on. <clears throat> All right, so what is the name of this variant? It is called the variant under investigation in December, 2020. Do you like how scientists, we, we call SARS and SARS-CoV-2 the virus, they're all very, very, very specific and not, not hugely creative, but so it's VUI 2020-12, slash zero one. And that's because it's the variant under investigation in December, 2020, and it's the first one. So that's why they call it zero one. Um, and so, so currently there's 17 different mutations. The most significant one is this one, this N501Y. And that's because it's the one that's affecting the spike protein. And the reason the spike protein is important again is because that is the one that our vaccines attack. Um, and so that's what we're, why we're looking at this closely. And it's also the one that's used to bind to the ACE2 receptor. All right, and that's why for the UK, there's a question of what we're, what we're looking at. So now the second question is, uh, or the first question is, does the variant spread more quickly? And so, so this is an interesting question to ask. So there's two ways of looking at this. So if a, if a variant is more common, it's hard to figure out, is it more common because the people who are spreading it are just more likely to have that virus. And it's not the virus itself that's more contagious. Rather, let's say you had a, a, a variant that was common among college students and the college students go out and party and they expose each other, they have super spreader events. Um, it's not the fact that the virus, per strain, or virus, virus variant per se is more contagious. It just happened to be the one that was spreading based on the behavior of the people who were spreading it. And guess what? We just had Thanksgiving time. I mean, that's the United States. In the UK, they've had other holidays. They had university and the people spreading it. And so it's an open question. Was it something that was due to the people who happened to be spreading it? That was just that they happened to have that variation. Or is there something about the genes in that virus that makes it more contagious? And so I'll dig into this a little bit. For now, what we know is that the variant is strongly associated with increased rates of COVID-19. <clears throat> so here we can say it's a correlation, but we don't know whether it's causation. So another way of saying that is we don't know if it's more contagious or whether it just happens to be the one that was infecting the people who are the super spreaders that spread it around. All right. All right, so the next thing. Okay. 
So um, the key here is that with the variant, there's no evidence that it will evade vaccination. So that was the question earlier about whether our vaccine. So right now, we're as, uh, assuming that the vaccines will be fully effective on it, that the um, S antigen has not been radically changed. It's essentially the same, slightly modified. The worry is if it continues to slightly get modified over time, that it could break out from the vaccine. And so that, that's something that we're looking at. Um, many thousands of mutations have already arisen over time. I mean, there have been many millions of people uh, who have gotten infected with SARS-CoV-2 over the past nine months. And so there have been many thousands of mutations that have just occurred naturally, and it hasn't really impacted the virus a whole lot. And so the reason that we're looking at it, it's more of like a barcode to monitor the outbreaks because it, it's sort of a fingerprint where you can then see who is infecting who around the, around the world and within different countries. And so it's a really great way of tracking spread, but it doesn't really seem to be impacting behavior a ton. Uh, and, and that is the behavior of the, of the virus. All right, the next thing. All right, so how was the bar variant detected? So in the United Kingdom, as well as in other countries, but this was first detected in the UK, um, they, they uh, regularly, randomly screen patients who test positive for SARS-CoV-2. And they take a sample of what they're, uh, they're uh, they, they take a sample from each patient who, uh, of, that they've selected, and they uh, look at the whole genome of the RNA in that patient. And so they have sequenced 140,000 virus genomes uh, since April uh, of, this, of this year. So that's a lot, 140,000 uh, different virus genomes in the UK. And so from that is where they've started picking up this new variant. Now within the new variant, they did four different studies and I'll, I'll just go through them quickly to show why we think that it's more likely to be the case that it, it truly is a more contagious virus as opposed to just what we might call a founder effect of where it's the super spreaders just happened to have one uh, variant and that it was just the super spreaders that were spreading it and it just happened to be that, that they had the founder effect. And the reason is, so, so there, let me go through these. The first is the, the growth rate from the genomic data. So this uh, variant is growing 70% higher than the other variants. So it's spread, so it is uh, occurring at a much higher rate than the other variants in the United Kingdom. Um, studies of correlation between our values are demonstrating that it has a, uh, on, on average an increase of the R value between essentially 0 0.4 to 0 0.9. Uh, so it increases the R value. And as we remember from earlier in the year, the higher the R value, the higher the spread. So an R value over one uh, makes it spread, an R, an R value of under one makes it the spread go down makes it less contagious. So if you already had an R value of say 1.4 and this lives, uh, lifts it to two, then it's going to spread a lot faster. So you will see a significant difference. Um, this doesn't, these two things are still consistent with the founder effects uh, depending on what you're looking at, but now it starts getting more interesting. Um, so the PCR values, I'm, I'm gonna skip to this one because this one I think is the most interesting. So the viral load. And so what they were looking at is people who have the virus, who are infected with, the, with this um, variant, the VUI 2020-1201, people with that variant had a 0.5 increase in the median log 10. So they had a higher viral load versus people who, who didn't have this, this variant. A higher viral load means that there's more copies of the virus in their body. And typically what that means is that the higher the viral load, the higher, the, the more contagious it is. Because all things being equal, if you have more copies of the virus, then there's more viral, and, and then and you have the same viral shedding rate relative to virus, then if there's more virus, then there's gonna be more viral shedding and more opportunity to infect other people. And so this, this means uh, that there's something that's different about the virus itself um, that is potentially making it more uh, contagious. And so, so because of this, other countries in Europe have now decided not to let anyone from UK um, travel to, to their countries. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if the United States made a similar type of, of announcement. And also because now this variant has been floating around uh, in nature for a while, just, just among natural spread, um, we should probably be checking for it more in the United States. <clears throat> so even though our testing and tracing is not where it needs to be, we should maybe focus our efforts now 
on this variant to see if we are finding it. Um, we, we don't typically genotype the tests that we get, but maybe we should be genotyping a higher sample to try to identify this, this, uh, this number. But, but it's still, to, to, you know, the, the main point here is you, we see how bad it is around the country and around the world right now, but in particular around the United States, people should be staying home as much as they possibly can. Whenever anyone goes out, do not leave the house without your mask. Um, we have to physically distance. We need to stay outdoors as much as we can. Even though it's cold, put on the hat and the gloves and the coat. Um, do, we need to be following best practices here. This virus is not going away anytime soon. And so, I mean, it, May is going to be here very quickly, March, April, May. The virus is gonna go way down uh, very rapidly in the spring because that's, that's typical cold flu season behavior. So it's the same behavior of the virus we're expecting for SARS-CoV-2. So by springtime, the numbers are gonna be way, way down. We can hold out just a few more months and just, just be very careful, everyone. We don't want anyone else to get sick or die. Um, and, and we are seeing it around the country that it is spreading like wildfire still. Um, so, so just assume that anyone that's around you has, uh, put, can potentially put you at risk. They might not have symptoms, they might be asymptomatic, uh, so we need to be very careful. Um, a couple more things about the UK variant and then we can go back on. Um, so there's two main variants. Um, the main one that we're talking about here, um, sometimes it's called the B1.1.7 variant. Um, this is again, is also the VUI 20, uh, 2020 12 that we just talked about, but it's also called, called this, has 17 mutations, uh, three, 14 replacements, three deletions. I'm not gonna get into the weeds too much, it's, it's too technical. Um, within these, muta within these uh, the mutations, you can see the lineages of variations that have come, that are uh, potentially coming through this. And you can see that they're, it's being heavily tracked, not just in the UK, but around the world. And you can see the reasons here for why they're doing it. Some might affect transmissibility, some might affect the binding affinity to the ACE2 receptor, lots of different reasons. Scientists are on top of it, we're tracking it, and, um, and so if you'll, you'll hear it. Any, any, any uh, new information about this, we'll, we'll be tracking it. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the one last thing to talk about here is the UK variant, um, what could be causing it to, to mutate in different ways. And we've talked about evolution before, that evolution requires mutation, uh, it requires a selective pressure and it requires uh, reproduction. So we have here mutations and reproductions. If there's a selective pressure, then the selective pressure might make it more likely to jump out of, uh, of uh, the, this, the, the and let's say right now the, the selection is from antibodies. So it might make it more likely to jump past uh, the antibodies. The, the, cur the current hypothesis is that people who are immunodeficient or immunodepressed or immunosuppressed patients. Um, a lot of times we found over the last nine months that if they get infected with SARS-CoV-2, it tends to be a chronic infection in them. And so as a result, um, they are um, more likely to have the SARS-CoV-2 for months. And among these patients, because there's so much reproduction going on in their bodies for so many months, there are a lot more mutations. And the problem is that we found is that if you give them, uh, a, say, convalescent plasma, then you might then that is a very specific subset of antibodies, and it can put pressure to uh, for the for the strains to, uh, or rather for the variants to uh, evolve in a in a specific direction based on that selection. So anyway, we're tracking this, and it's something that we are keeping track of. All right, Rebecca, next. Excellent, Glenn. Thank you for that information and. That was really interesting to find out how the naming of these different variants. And uh, I always wondered why it was so boring. And, and I'm glad it's not like the way hurricanes are named because you know I certainly wouldn't want any of these variants to be named Rebecca or Glenn. Can you imagine yeah. if one of these variants was named Glenn right now and <laughs> forevermore? <laughs> oh, no. And that's why, and that's why they don't, in fact, you, you recall that we used to call it things like the Spanish flu. Mm -hmm. And even that was seen as unethical because we wouldn't want to put a burden on, on a group of people or an individual when there's no connection at all. And so that's why we no longer name diseases after groups of people or countries or anything like that. 
because it, it's it's uh, unethical essentially. So that's why also we wouldn't have names like call it the, the unless sometimes uh, still uh, diseases might be named after someone who was important in their discovery or uh, research, but even that we're shifting away from. So it's more clinical. Almost every new disease that's being identified, classified, or characterized is now um, just given some sort of more archaic name as opposed to named after a person. Yeah, it's, it's pretty darn vanilla. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I can't even imagine more vanilla than the way you just described. So okay. thanks, thank you for that detail. That's really interesting. So we are we are almost at our time together. How about we wrap up with um let's see a couple a couple last questions here. Let's see if we can if we can fit in a couple more. Um, a question came in. Let's see. Can people who receive the monoclonal antibody treatment get the vaccine? And let's see. And similarly, can folks who were previously infected? get the vaccine? Yeah, these are two really, really good questions. Um, so the first one, <clears throat> pardon me. So people who, who got the monoclonal antibodies, so or, or convalescent plasma, but in particular the monoclonal antibodies, um, although I think it would apply for both. Um, th that's sort of sometimes seen as passive therapy where it's an pure antibodies are injected into somebody the problem is based on the half-life of these antibodies, they stay in someone's body for a while. That's a good thing because it has this protective effect that lingers and persists for a while. So if someone got infected with COVID-19 and received the monoclonal antibodies, then they're likely to be protected. I wouldn't count on it. I wouldn't just take off your mask and, and go part out partying. But if you received a monoclonal antibody, then it's likely that the antibodies persist in the body for a while. Current, the current thinking is that they persist for weeks. There's, it, there's a half-life, so it goes down and down and down. But by 90 days, it's almost all gone from the body at that point. And so, and so typically what we're thinking, it hasn't really been studied. So this is more just our best thinking about it, even though we don't really have strong uh, uh, empirical evidence to evaluate it. It's just based on the half-life calculations. Um, the current best thinking is that if someone receives monoclonal antibodies, they should wait approximately 90 days before they get the vaccine. And so that's currently the, the best thinking. If someone was infected um, and hasn't received a monoclonal antibody or, or the convalescent plasma, then they can, then if, they, if they're actively infected and they're contagious, then they should not get the vaccine right now, unless they're in a long-term care facility. If they're in a long-term care facility, then that's apparently okay. Even if they were just exposed, potentially exposed, it's still okay to get vaccinated in a long-term care facility. However, if they are, um, uh, currently exposed, then you should quarantine yourself and, and not put others at risk. So you should not get the vaccine until the 10 or 14 days period has, has passed uh, until, and until your symptoms are gone. Um, and so then that's that. But then once that period is over, um, then you can get vaccinated. As soon as your symptoms are gone, uh, then you can, you can immediately go and get vaccinated. There's no other uh, uh, reason not to get vaccinated at that point if you're eligible. Um, so other people can receive it just in case there's questions. People who are pregnant or breastfeeding, yes, they can receive the vaccine. People who have problems with their immune systems or have autoimmune or rheum uh, rheumatological disorders, yes, they can all receive the vaccine. Uh, and again, anyone who's ever had a previous COVID-19 infection, they can get vaccinated. Um, a couple more things on this. That's, that's the gist of it. <clears throat> um, but you can go to this website. This is this, it, the, the information comes from the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP. Uh, it's on the vaccine and immunization website with the CDC. Again, key thing is 90 days after the monoclonal antibodies is, is good for the vaccines. And the key thing here is that, um, is that if you have acute illness, like I just said, you have, you have uh, symptoms, you just got exposed, um, then you should wait until the acute period is over, that 10 to 14 day period until the symptoms are gone. Great, next question. All right, so why don't we, Glenn, we're at the hour. Um, Harry, let's see, we're, I'm going, let me go to, let's see if I can unmute you. You had a great question about Thanksgiving and now many celebrate, are going to be celebrating Christmas this week. I'm going to ask you to unmute and ask about family gatherings and Glenn, maybe you can give some advice to those who might be celebrating this week. 
Um, Harry, if you want to ask your question about. Yes, so the question is that with the statistical models that you have, was there a relationship between what we're looking at now and Thanksgiving? And if that's the case, can we expect the same thing to occur with Christmas and New Year's? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. So here's the period that we're talking about right here. So if you recall the period around Thanksgiving, we were going up, 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 up. And then people weren't tested for a few days. They were still getting sick, but they were not being tested over Thanksgiving and the weekend after Thanksgiving. So by the time we started reporting it again, it was at a much higher level. It's a little bit hard to see um, in terms of what it is, but you know, frankly, it looks like it, it just was a continuation. So maybe we would have gotten a little bit under control a little sooner, but instead we got pumped it up a little bit higher. Um, and so now what I would expect, the, the hospitalizations, uh, I, wouldn't, I don't see any clear break. Like, so for instance, if Thanksgiving had been an impact, then Thanksgiving was around this period, that long weekend, I would have expected like 10 to 14 days later, the, the rate to be more steep going up, but instead it's not quite as steep. <clears throat> now we know regionally that there is huge variation, so it might make sense to look at this year um, and maybe a signal might come up a little bit more. Um, so after, so, so it could be that we saw an in continued increase in the Northeast and that we would have leveled out at the hospitals a little bit earlier if it wasn't for Thanksgiving. Um, I don't know, um, but, and in, in, in terms of um, the, the Thanksgiving in the Midwest, who knows, maybe it could have gone down a little sooner. From Thanksgiving, I don't see any, there's nothing that really pops out at a high level but the numbers are still getting much worse in much of the country. And so Thanksgiving, I'm certain contributed to that, but whether it contributed to it in a way that was significantly more than the week before Thanksgiving, I don't know. A lot of these trend lines look very similar in the week before versus the time after Thanksgiving. So um, what specific advice do you, do you have for, for us with you now and those watching on YouTube later on for, for thanks for Christmas gatherings, New Year's gatherings, what, what do you recommend? Well, so this goes back to the super spreader events. The advice that I had for Thanksgiving is the same advice, if I can find the slide, the same advice that we would give now. It's too late to quarantine or do anything like that um, at this point. Um, just because, uh, so, so Christmas is December 25th. Um, so Christmas Eve to December 24th. It's now December 20th. It requires at least 10 to 14 days of preferably 14 days of quarantine prior. And so by, what I mean by that is pure quarantine, not leaving the house, not going to the supermarket, not pot potentially exposing yourself in any way. Because a lot of people think, oh, I'm staying home. And so that means that I'm quarantining and not putting anyone else at risk. When in reality, they leave and go to the supermarket. Maybe they do another errand once every couple of days. That's not quarantining because you put yourself at risk at the second you leave the house. <clears throat> Even opening the door, the front door potentially puts you at risk. So if someone comes to your door, you let them put whatever packages or whatever outside, then after they leave, then you open the door and get it. Um, that's, that's what I'm talking about by quarantine. So, it's, so um, right now, so New Year's, is there is still some uh, enough time as of today, December 20th, if you wanted to quarantine to, to, to shelter in place until New Year's Eve so that you could go out without risking infecting someone else. So the key thing is that it more than anything is, is to, um, let me see if I can find it. I'm not gonna be able to find the exact, uh, the exact slide as before, but the, the key thing here it is. Um, all adults must quarantine, um, uh, not hopefully elementary school kids are not really going to school anymore now that they're on, about to enter winter break. Um, anyone with co possible COVID-19 symptoms during that period must not attend. Most likely, once the symptoms subside for the vast majority of people, um, they will not uh, be infective. However, that's on average. We do know that there are people now who have been shedding virus and can infect others, they're contagious for multiple months. As I, as I pointed out, it's people who are, are typically immunosuppressed uh, or on immunosuppressive drugs can contribute to people shedding virus long-term. We have seen this more than once, and so it's possible. And so if, and so if you have symptoms and you are immunosuppressed or on uh, immunosuppressant therapy, then, then uh, this, the rules don't apply. 
uh, because it could spread could happen more uh, over a much longer time frame than that. Um, there should be uh, even when you get together, um, if possible, people should be um, have outdoor air exchange, physical distance, wear a mask when not eating, lower the volume of background noise so to reduce shouting or, or raising your voice because that helps aerosols come out. Um, and so lowering the volume makes people talk more quietly and there's less aerosols produced uh, and limit the time. Um, even if everyone has had the best precautions, um, it's still better. I mean, for sure, if everyone truly quarantines, there's zero outdoor exposure of anyone, then the risk is going to be very, very low and you don't need to do all of these things. But if there's any risk at all, better to be safe than sorry. And these are some of the other things that people um, are, have been doing. Great, Rebecca. Thank you. On behalf of all of us, your very, very, very appreciative audience. Thank you for all of your hard work in answering all of our questions. I know many of us ask you lots of questions, including me. Does the vaccine have to match like my shoes? So thank you <laughs> <laughs> for taking all of us seriously for our little questions, our big questions, our middle of the night questions. We really appreciate everything that you're doing. You're keeping us all very, very safe and feeling secure through this crazy, crazy time. And we cannot say thank you enough. And we really appreciate it. And to everybody, we wish you very, very happy holidays. All our best to your families. And we look forward to seeing you back here safe and sound. Same time, same place next Sunday. Have a happy and healthy week, everybody. Be well. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Bye-bye.